Uh, we are here live on 2025 events uh, broadcasted from various locations across the globe. Uh, I'm here located in Rad Vision offices in Tel Aviv. Uh, Idaro Sylvester is located in California. Uh, Ran Mangalit is located in New Jersey. And Soran, where are you now? Uh, I'm in New York. You are in New York. Okay, so you didn't add any new time zone to this panel. Uh, next time <laughs> we'll do it while you are in... Uh, I did uh, not. Something. Apologies. Something like you, can, <laughs> you can beat up later. <laughs> okay. He'll beat you up during the panel. <laughs> Uh, that's also true. Uh, you have to know that Tita Rose and I go a long way back. We've been in several panels together, so she's used to the uh, unique style. Uh, today we're going to talk about the future of shopping. Uh, each and every one of you guys are uh, today changing the way, the way people uh, shop and make decisions on what they want to shop and how they pay also. Uh, and this is a fascinating uh, uh, area uh, because it's uh, unlike some of the other topics we are talking about uh, in this event, this is something that everybody does, right? Everybody at the end of the day go to uh, shop things and spend his hard-earned cash. So uh, without further ado, I would like to ask you uh, a question. Uh, how do you change the shopping experience today? Either Rose? Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Ida Rose Sylvester, and I'm serving as the U.S. Uh, business development director for a company called APTA Me. Uh, so APTA, fit for you. Uh, we basically have solved a very crucial problem with online shopping, um, actually all shopping, finding the size that really fits you. Uh, it sounds very, very simple, and that's the beauty of it. We let you create a profile online of your size that you can take with you to any of our uh, shops that are enabled. And from there, we match you up with the databases of the actual clothing sizes, not like a size large, but the actual measurements of those clothes from different designers. So you can find the fit that's right for you, no matter where you go shopping online, by creating your profile simply just one time. Fascinating. So you can do the shopping <laughs> without uh, leaving your home. Uh, so even if the, the sports that we used to do, the, the physical activity of actually going to the shop is being uh, diminished by your uh, by your company. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. The uh, the online shopping experience is enhanced. I don't know because our if you know your fit in different style of clothing or different brands of clothing, you could take those measurements with you to a mall as well and have a better sense before you walk into that store that this is the size you need in this designer. It improves, it, de it decreases the amount of time you would spend shopping in a store, uh, but it also improves the online experience for the consumer. It makes it much more guaranteed you'll get the clothes that you want shopping online. Mm -hmm. that, sounds, that sounds fascinating. And Ran, how do you change the shopping experience today? Well, we're aiming at uh, removing the cashiers and the lines and the product scanning. Uh, from the day-to-day -day activities. So you will walk into a supermarket, go to the shelf, take whatever you want, and go home. You don't need to stop anywhere. We recognize who you are, and we know what you took from the shelf because we retrofit the store shelves with a smart shelf. And that's it. That sounds a bit uh, big brotherish. What do you mean by you know who, who I am? So today we know who you are by you presenting uh, an RFID card or an NFC phone to the shelf. So as you come near the shelf, you hold it, your card, your supermarket card. We read, we read it from about uh, 20 centimeters far from from the shelf, and we say, um, you know, hi, Ida Rose, take whatever you want. And as you start taking <laughs> stuff, uh, the shelves are sensitive to uh, to weight, and they know what product on them. And as you take them, we know simply what you took, and we know who you are, so we charge your credit card, and at this point you can just go home. And you can actually return stuff as well. Really simple. Uh, we do, uh, uh, there are different verticals that we do. This is uh, uh, just a supermarket idea, but uh, in the vending world, we're doing the same thing. We have a, a, a fridge with different stuff in it. Uh, the fridge is locked, the door is locked, so you wave your card, now you can open the door, take whatever you want, close the fridge door, and, and you're done. And you don't even need the card. If you walk in the airport soon, you'll be able to use your QR code reader, point it at the fridge, 
It will take you to our website. You enter your credit card information one time, and every time you point your QR code reader to that fridge, it actually opens the door for you. Take whatever you want. It will be charged. Fascinating. So it's kind of a... Uh, we are eliminating the, the, the salespeople. You're eliminating, as you said, the cashier. And your company's name is Shellfax, right? Shellfax, yes. Uh, from the consumer side, yes, we're eliminating the cashiers uh, and the need to stand in line. But from the store side, we tell them what's on their shelves at any given moment. We tell them who put it there. We tell them who took it. We have a lot of data about the consumption. For example, if you remove an item and you put it back and you don't like it, we know that too. So there, there is a lot of information we are gathering about the behavior. That sounds good. Um, Saran, how do you change uh, the shopping experience today? I run a company called Bodymetrics, and uh, what Bodymetrics has been doing um, for the last several years is what we would consider to be pioneering the next generation of clothing or apparel e-commerce. Essentially what that means is that um, although apparel e-commerce is a large category, it is one of the largest categories in e-commerce, um, frankly it has failed in that it's only 10% of people uh, shop for clothing online compared to something like you know 90% plus for other categories like airline tickets. And even that 10% of people who shop online, there's a lot of pain. Um, you know, there's a lot of returns, anywhere between 20 to 40%. And that's not good for the consumers, the retailers, and the environment. And our view is that this problem can only be solved by offering the bridge between stores, physical stores, and the digital world um, online, and vice versa from online stores who are now increasingly going offline, enabling that bridge as well. And the way we do that is by using several tools. The fundamental tool is, is the notion of scanning your body. So what happens is that you go to a store, you get your body scanned uh, very accurately with where we get hundreds of measurements and all your shape information within seconds. That profile, that body metrics account is uploaded to onto the cloud and you have your um, account that can be used for shopping on any device anywhere. We enable a significant um, increase in sales in store. So we have three years of uh, very compelling data where we pioneered this at Selfridges, which is voted as the world's best department store for four years running. It has a track record, Selfridges, of innovation from with it's put in the cosmetics counters on the ground floor to uh, actually the first place to demonstrate TV to the world. So we have data now uh, as a retail format, uh, which is very compelling. We do about um, retail sales per square foot, roughly comparable to Tiffany. So it point of view. But then when those customers go online, that enables those customers to continue that shopping experience. And similarly, what we're witnessing is that um, online retailers setting up pop-up shops and we're enabling those. So it's really physical to digital, digital to physical, and it's allowing you to shop uh, knowing that things are going to fit you. Um, and it's all driven by uh, pretty much bottom line economics uh, in terms of um, in terms of return on investment. I saw your uh, CES booth uh, together with Prime Sense. Prime Sense were, mm -hmm. were uh, Adi Berenson from Prime Sense was speaking in uh, uh, this event in 2025 yesterday in a panel about the future of the living room, and uh, seeing that uh, that uh, that booth and the abilities were very impressive. Um, we saw also a lot of people talking about it on the network. Um, so it's a very impressive technology. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think when we look back on this decade, um, say in, in 2020, uh, we'll look at what are the most fundamental breakthroughs technologies of this decade. And I have no doubt uh, PrimeSense and then the Kinect by Microsoft, uh, which has the PrimeSense device, 
uh, will stand out as one of the key technologies that changed this decade. Because um, fundamentally, when you look at it, it's allowing computers to see, right? We have the technologies for computers to hear. Um, we haven't got a lot of other sensors yet. And people have been waiting for a low cost mechanism for, for computers to see and uh, get, uh, understand what they're looking at understand the measurements, understand, um, you know, different characteristics of someone and a whole bunch of stuff. But yeah, absolutely. Um, the founders of PrimeSense will, will go down in history as, uh, as the guys who enabled this, uh, this revolution and obviously, you know, massively popularized uh, with the reach of uh, Microsoft and Kinect, uh, which obviously is about 20 million homes. And I think that's just the beginning. Um. What are the new expectations, uh, in your opinion, uh, that consumers have today that weren't in the past from their shopping experience, either of those? Um, what, are the, what are the expectations, the new expectations of consumers uh, in their shopping experience that didn't exist uh, two, three, five years ago? in your opinion? Well, I think if you look at online commerce or online fashion shopping in particular, the experience today is, generally speaking, subpar to shopping in, a, say, the mall or in a regular retail store. You can't try on the clothes. You can't feel the fabric. You can't go with your friends and have a social experience, especially for women. Shopping is an extremely social experience where it almost has nothing to do with the clothing but about sharing ideas and you like this on me and feeling good about yourself. So the online shopping experience is basically a stripped down, watered down version of, of that. Uh, I think some of the technologies we're looking at today are trying to move online apparel shopping to be a much more comparable experience to shopping at the mall. So you get a better sense of colors and fit and size. But I think in three to five years, we want to make the online shopping experience even better than the, the mall experience. We want to be able to bring social into the online experience, for example. So you don't miss out on that experience of people like me like this product. People like me say, I look good in this product. So I think we're, we have a, in three to five years, we'll be looking at technologies that not only make clothing shopping online safe and easy so that more than 10% of the population will do it and that 30% of the clothes won't get returned, I think we'll make it uh, a much more in, uh, vivid experience than even shopping in a mall today. And if we don't, online clothing sales will go nowhere. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how do you see it? Sorry, uh, do you want to get some? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't how hear do you. Uh, how do you see the, the, consumer, the new expectations of consumers uh, today from their shopping experience? Um, I don't understand the question. <laughs> okay, so when I, went, okay, when I was a kid, I went to the small grocery store at the end of my street. We had a small uh, uh, paper card, right? And uh, I was able to, uh, uh, to sign my name near the, 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 the candy that I bought. And my father uh, paid for the, the candy once a month. And uh, we had only one kind of candy in that specific store. And uh, it seems okay, right? And we had only one brand of cheese. And it seemed okay. And then came the supermarkets. And uh, when we saw the supermarkets, we had gazillion types of candies. But we didn't have these small paper cards, right? Uh, we didn't know the people working for the, uh, at the specific uh, uh, supermarket, uh, unlike uh, the small grocery store. And also, we, you know, the prices of, uh, appeared in different ways. Uh, we were expecting to see uh, um, people that are dressed, the, the team that was working for the store dressed in a different way. The whole experience, as an experience, completely changed. Now we're moving into an, er an, an era when we see the digital and physical mix in different ways. And so my question is, how does the shopping experience is changing today, in your opinion, from what you see from your clients or from your experience, um, 
in compare, compared to five or ten years ago? It's actually interesting you're bringing the, the old experience, the old days, because uh, our slogan is nothing really changed. And <laughs> the story is about that time that, that you walked to the store, they knew who you are and what you took, wrote it down in a book, and you would pay at the end of the month and it was personal. And uh, as a society, we managed to bring those horrible conveyor belts and custom. I mean, today it's, it's really to sto sh shop at the store is, oh, we don't understand it, but it's really, really bad. You go, you take stuff, nobody knows you. You stand in lines that they cannot manage because they can never have the right number of cashiers. They, uh, they cannot have too many, they will cost them too much, and then they reduce it to a number which is uh, ridiculous. You have to stand and wait for them. And then they decided to invent this self-checkout, which makes you now the cashier. Now you need to scan all the products, and you need to bag them, and it doesn't always work, and, and you try to show the, the camera what, what you're taking. And, and the problem is not at all at the checkout. The problem is actually at the shelf. If, if Joe, the store owner, will walk with you and see who you are and what you're taking, there's no need for a checkout process. They know who you are and what you took. And, and this is going away. Uh, in 2025, I believe that the shelves will use the same technologies that PrimeSense we're talking about, that they will recognize you without the need for a card or a phone. You just walk and they know who you are by face recognition. And um, the shelf knows what's on it, and that's it. That's it. That will be the difference. Going back to the old days. <laughs> uh, that's a nice. That's a really nice slogan. I wonder how did you how did you manage to raise money with a slogan saying that nothing's going to change? But it's uh, but it's a very <laughs> nice slogan. <laughs> I, I didn't manage to raise money with that slogan, by the way. <laughs> but uh, we're working on it. Um, Shelfax is, is a relatively uh, young company. Uh, it is. You were founded, and uh, how long ago were you founded? A year and a half ago. Um, yeah. We uh, managed to, in a year and a half, to produce product, uh, all the electronics, all the software. Uh, we had called, I mean, Walmart, Microsoft, IBM called us when they saw the, the first release. Uh, we were invited to present to their innovation centers. It's really nice. It's going really well. I'm happy to hear that. Well, I, I know what's your vision for yourself for 2025. We're going to talk about the size of the pool later on. Um, Soran, how do you see the changes in, uh, in customer expectations or customer experiences in the shopping process today? Well, I think it's really interesting the, the, um, the kind of history that you, that you mapped out, uh, you know, when you were, from when you were a child uh, buying candy. And uh, and obviously what what you touched upon there is that um, the world has become a lot more globalized, um, so we have a you know hell of a lot more choice, um, but we do, we haven't um, but there's a penalty to pay for that choice, uh, and I'll tell you you know from in the particular area that we operate in, uh, frankly what that penalty has been. So if you, if you go like three generations ago in the most of the Western world and still in some parts of the developing world, frankly, you had a perfect solution to the clothing problem, if you can call it that. Um, you had a local tailor who had a limited amount of fabrics who took the measurements from you and would create a garment that fitted you. So that was, a, if you like, a perfect solution to that problem of clothing fit. But uh, the downside of that was that, you know, like in your childhood candy store, the, 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 you know, the amount of candies were limited. So in this case, the amount of fabrics were limited, you know, and, and the amount of styles were limited because your local guy or woman was only exposed to a certain amount of trends and so forth. So obviously with, with globalization, what, what obviously happened is that um, our pool of accessible brands grew exponentially, um, but to serve that exponential demand, if you like, um, what you had to do is that you had to make some choices. You had to make, you had to consider people just like they were a widget in a car 
or a, or a mold for a candy. So you had to take an assumption that actually people were of a particular type, an average, if you like, and you had to use that mold with a view of serving all these people because you simply did not have that one-to-one -one link that you had with your tailor. So with that, you know, uh, w with that rose the problem in that what happens now is that all retailers have to make an average, this is I'm talking about ready-to-wear garments, an average mold, if you like, in this case, what's called a pattern, and they make certain assumptions of what the average person looks like, you know, off for that particular target demographic. But the problem with that is that there's no such average when it comes to people, because, you know, we're all, you know, we're seven billion people, but actually we're different in seven billion ways. So, um, so even the molds that are, you know, targeted to a particular niche, say, let's say, women between, you know, 19 to 21, uh, in a particular country, in a particular income level, that still, there's lots of variations in that hundreds of thousands of people that particular mold is meant to serve. So that's the crux of the problem, if you like. So the way you have to solve that to some extent in the ultimate way is to go back to what it was and to use Ryan's analogy, trying to use technology in this case to go to a era if you can where nothing changed. And which is hard. So in ideal world, what you want to be able to do is to use technology to allow the sort of personalized understanding that your local tailor had to be able to produce garments. Or if you can't produce them on a one to one basis, which is has the horrible phrase of mass customization, uh, then at least try and find the garments that best fit you, provided that they know who you are. They know what, you know, what your body, um, you know, shape, size, measurements, and maybe uh, taste. So it's that area that I think that obviously we're playing in. And that's, I think, the biggest difference I think you're going to see in clothing, fashion, apparel, whichever name you're going to use to describe the sector. Because I think you're going to see a, a realization that we are fundamentally flawed uh, in where we are. Uh, because of the molds are not one mold, everybody, every brand has a different mold. So the problem is fundamentally, you know, messed up. And it's only by using technology, in this case, um, you know, visual technologies, if you like, or, you know, um, uh, machine vision type technology as the base and a whole bunch of analytics uh, surround it, that you can s start to deliver really personalized solutions to this, whether it's made to measure garments that fit you perfectly without a size label, just with your name uh, as the tag. Um, and as for example, not a size 10, but actually it's Ida Rose scanned on, you know, July 2012, or with the view that, you know, you find the garments that best match you from the you know, universe that is available. So we've just seen this revolution happening, and I think by 2025, um, I would see that this is pretty much the norm. Uh, we are still going to have made to uh, standard off the bed garments, but we'll have a, a much better sense of tools to find uh, garments that are personal to you. And there'll be a massive rise in uh, made to measure garments. Um, uh, you know, if you like made to measure suits, uh, couture, if you like, uh, digitally enabled couture for women. Uh, and you're going to see that very much in a, in a, uh, a massive growth in that area. So in that sense, you're trying to recreate the personal link we had with the tailor several generations ago, but with technology, but actually in a globalized context. So I as you get scanned in New York, your, your garments might be, you know, made either in Tel Aviv or in Shanghai, and they're delivered to you within a week. That can be fascinating. We have in, uh, uh, in, in Israel, we have uh, uh, one brand that uh, it's called Castro. So as soon as they release uh, a specific type of T-shirt, a day later you see everybody in the street wearing the same T-shirt. Uh, it's very, very strong also when you're talking about uh, uh, their, their, the winter clothes. They have a specific sweater, and you buy the sweater, and you feel very, very good about yourself, and then you go out of the mall, and everybody in the street have the same sweater. Uh, so the, the point that you are making that we're going to have this kind of ability to uh, um, create customized clothing in a simpler way and still not uh, um, 
skip the element of variety is, uh, is extremely interesting, uh, in my opinion. Um, okay, so we're talking about the consumer. We're talking about uh, the cashier that if run will be successful, needs to find a new job. Um, we're talking about uh, uh, the ability to really find the right clothes uh, for you and speed up the, 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 the buying process uh, that is being done by, uh, by both from different direction, by, by Saran's company and the Rose's company. Uh, but what about the marketeers? You know, the guys are supposed, at the end of the day, uh, to, they're facing all these new technologies, they're facing uh, all these new tools that you guys are providing, uh, and especially when you're talking about retail, in many cases, the sales, uh, the salespeople and uh, the marketeers are being uh, uh, measured based on the success, the economic success of their work. How these, uh, all these new inventions will change the way that products are being marketed and not only sold, uh, in your op opinion? Either Rose? Well, I, I think you mentioned the, the perfect point. These marketeers are judged based on their sales, and I think the technologies that improve the online experience do two fundamental things. One, they increase the amount of sales that people make online. If you shop with confidence knowing an item will fit, you shop with confidence knowing that other people like you buy this item, you'll buy more. Um, the other thing, if you reduce the amount of returns, that improves the bottom line directly. Uh, because clothing typically has a very low profit margin. If you have 30, 40% returns, you're eating up your entire profit margin in, in those returns. So I think marketeers should uh, love the technologies, even though they can be threatening, and online shopping is very threatening to the brick and mortar companies. But if they embrace the fact that more sales, more loyalty, fewer returns, it, it's a no brainer. That's true. So from the bottom line, uh, perspective, it makes, uh, it makes a lot of sense. How do you see it, Saran? So I, I think um, we, we're perhaps in a slightly privileged position of having, you know, three years worth of, um, you know, very good data in perhaps one of the toughest retail environments in the world, um, serving some of the, uh, the most demanding customers in the world. So I think what we have shown is that you can use this new technologies and actually create a, a retail format, if you will, which um, outperforms existing retail formats by a significant margin. Uh, and in this case, we, we do about one and a half million dollars of sales from a tiny area of 300 square feet, uh, which is one of the highest productivity, you know, um, numbers in, in retail in the world. Obviously, not as at all as productive as Apple. Uh, Apple is a, is a phenomenon, you know, beyond anything. I just don't know how you, you know, you, you know, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, if, if retailers try to compare themselves with Apple, they just, you know, commit suicide every day. But anyway, um, apart from Apple, um, you know, when you talk about normal, mere mortal retailers, it's, it's a pretty, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a pretty impressive uh, figure. So, so in that case, uh, we won the argument, if you like, that you don't need to think so hard. Just look at this very clear metric of sales per square foot. So that is what marketers understand. That is what retailers understand. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you. There is still um, a lot more education that needs to be done. Uh, about and this is where you know um, companies like that that Ida Rose represents uh, companies like myself. Uh, we 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 are all part of a movement, if you like, that is showing that you know you can use technology to personalize experiences online. And I think um, still there's a lot lot of um, lot um, we need to convince perhaps more marketers that actually you know you could for the first time offer highly personalized targeted uh, products that fit somebody's body shapes or size which means that they're much more likely to buy that and I think these sort of concepts are still very new sort of you know body size or shape based marketing is still a very new concept 
And I think it's going to take a while for, for marketers to understand that. Uh, but I think we, you know, we, we're all part of this movement that we are educating the, the marketers uh, in this new area. People are very, obviously, marketers are very comfortable with the notion of um, demographic based uh, marketing. So that is based on income, for example, or where you live, um, you know, what you might have bought in the past. But this whole area of shape, body shape, body size, body um, um, body preference-based marketing, we're just starting that. That's fascinating. Now we can we should buy the URL, body shape-based marketing. I think that's a bit too long and a clunky. <laughs> I don't think it's a great no. great URL. Anyway, <laughs> that's a marketing question. Uh -huh. Uh, that's that's true, but that's uh, that's a fascinating uh, 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 vision. I just want to uh, interrupt you for for a second because we have a question from the audience um, mm -hmm. that uh, one of the persons saying that there is a niche that we are all uh, completely not taking into account, which is uh, the individual marketing uh, the individual who is marketing uh, products or services online, and the direct sales market has a huge is a huge market, and uh, it is true that we are all talking all the time through this panel about um, about uh, about retailers, basically, but not necessarily about the one-man show uh, who is able uh, maybe have a, an eBay kind of business uh, to sell clothes and to sell products. Uh, how do you see, uh, Ran? How do you how do you see this market uh, affected by the technologies that we are uh, discussing in the panel today? The uh, first of all, the, the, the technology that we introduced uh, added a lot of information to the personal touch. Uh, when you walk into the to the shelf, and we already know who you are and what's your purchase history, and hopefully what's your size and measurements, and then we can make a decision because we have an LCD that communicates with you to tell you. Uh, hey, do you want to try this product as well? Do you want to, uh, you know, give you some, some some suggestions, some buying other products that relate to what you're going to buy right now? The second you pick up the item, we know that you are closer to a purchase. We know that now you're really interested, and we can actually now change our, our theme and say, and by the way, and if you buy that one, uh, you know, we can give you 25% off. So, uh, the, the fact that we know more about you actually, you know, than it's personal, you know, changes the how the marketeer will will think and where where is he going to invest his dollars in in, in advertisement and marketing. Um, uh, the sizes, uh, as Ron talked about, the size of the stores uh, in the, with this technology, when you remove cashiers and conveyor belts, you in some stores, you save about a quarter of the store size. So now you can use that for other things. Maybe in 2025, we, didn't, we don't know what there are yet. But maybe, maybe it's a personal touch. Maybe it's a personal helper. Maybe it's a station where you stand and they scan you and they say, okay, this is who you are. Now let me guide you through the store. Um, if, if I can add to that, I think... Yes, please Sorry. Um, it, it, yeah, I mean, I think what's um, what's really interesting to comment about what Ran and other people like Ran are doing is that um, when you look at physical stores, physical retailers, frankly, innovation in this area has been very little over the last 10, 20, 30 years, you know, relative to uh, let me let me let me rephrase that. Let's say over the last 10 years, just to kind of. Um, you know, defend that statement. Uh, on the other hand, there's been so much innovation online. So much. I mean, you know, a website, what we have today compared to 10 years ago, you know, you can't even recognize it. There's, so there's so much of innovation, brain power, uh, talented people, capital that has gone into um, me, uh, innovative uh, technology services in the online space. But actually, correspondingly, there hasn't, in my opinion, that much of uh, investment, talent, talented individuals, companies, uh, focusing really on in-store, um, in innovating the store. And I think Rand is very much part of that movement who 
I think, uh, you know, stores are increasingly realizing actually that we do, they do need to innovate. They need, do need to use technology. They need to become relevant to consumers' lives. Uh, and whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's the use of, um, you know, data capture, whether it's the use of, you know, smartphone links after you've shopped. And I think, um, and I think you're going to see a lot more innovation in the physical stores, like what Ryan is doing, um, as much as you've seen innovation in the digital realm in retailing. Ida Rose, your thought about it? Uh, yeah, I'd like to jump in as well on that question. The question from the audience is, is actually excellent. The Internet is the great enabler of the individual, the great democratizer <laughs> in many, many ways. Um, and we do see a rise of more individuals, especially in the fashion space, small designers or individual designers finding a way online. But the com companies like ModCloth have become extremely powerful because a designer of clothing is not an accountant, not a marketeer, doesn't know about reaching the channel necessarily. So they might get more of a voice, more of a marketplace. But I think it's very, very hard for an individual themselves to create a very strong online presence. Uh, but I do think the democratization of any kind of small online commerce company, uh, any small per, uh, company, any uh, individual is really increasing. But you still need a, a channel to help those people get to the market. Yeah, I completely agree with you, and I think that we've uh, we've covered a lot of different aspects uh, of uh, how technology changes uh, the the experience of shopping. Uh, we we have to wrap it up. I'm uh, I'm, I'm sad to say uh, that uh, this panel has to uh, to come to an end because we are not uh, at 2025. We are still at 2012. Um, first of all, thank you very much for being a part of this panel. I think that you've um, you've delivered a very vivid and clear vision uh, of the future. And uh, more than that, uh, it's amazing that all of your products and technologies are out there now, basically. People can actually uh, use them, whether to just go to a store and just pick up a, 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 an item and go. Uh, just make sure that it's clear that uh, you have a Ran Margalit's product there because otherwise it will be considered theft. Um, you can uh, uh, go to... Uh, uh, to, to either Rose's uh, company and check your and, and see how your clothes fit you and of course Saran's uh, great products that enable us not only to do it on our home but also to do those uh, crazy uh, go into those crazy booths and, uh, and, and measure uh, clothes on, uh, uh, on us um, it's really really it was really, really uh, a great panel uh, we're going to use some of the content of this panel in the interactive book that we're going to, do, to publish uh, after uh, the event uh, that is uh, an interactive book for, for the iPad, um, and uh, we would love to get some material from you guys uh, for that as well. And uh, Perfect. thank you very much for taking the time for being a part of our event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.